Welcome, everyone, to the Great Mind series, where we dive into meaningful and thought provoking discussions on key philosophical questions. Today, we are turning our attention in a fascinating intersection how Buddhist philosophy, especially Madhyamaka, engages with and challenges Western idea about the mind and consciousness. I'm thrilled to welcome Professor Jay Garfield, a leading authority on Buddhist philosophy and his engagement with Western thought. Professor Garfield has made profound contribution to our understanding of Madhyamaka philosophy, offering fresh perspective on its relevance within contemporary philosophical discourse. His work bridges Eastern and Western tradition with exceptional clarity, providing valuable insight that challenge and deepen our understanding of consciousness, self, and reality. It's an honor to have him with us today to explore these intricacy ideas and help us navigate through the fascinating intersections between this philosophical world. In today's session, we will explore the convergence between Buddhist thoughts, particularly Madhyamaka and key ideas in Western philosophy. Our goal is to delve into how this tradition not only just oppose, but also enrich and challenge each other, offering fresh perspective on consciousness, the self, and the natures of reality. Before we dive in into today's discussion, Jay, I would love to hear about your own intellectual journey. You know, what initially drew you to Buddhist philosophy and how did you come to engage Eastern and Western philosophical tradition in dialogue? And were there any key moments or thinkers that significantly shaped this path for you? Sure. Um, in my case, it's actually almost by accident um, because my training was entirely in Western philosophy. Um, I always say that I'm practicing without a license when I work in Asian philosophy. Um, in the time that I went to graduate school, and this is still largely true in the world today, sadly, though it's improving, um, non-Western philo philosophical traditions simply weren't taught in major graduate programs in philosophy. So I finished my PhD literally not knowing that there was any philosophy done outside of the European tradition. But I finished my PhD and went to get, take my first teaching job at a college called Hampshire College in the United States. And the very first student who walked into my office, um, literally while I was unpacking my books in my very first professional office, um, was came in and asked me to direct his senior thesis in philosophy on intersections between medieval Tibetan epistemology and the social contract tradition. And when he asked me to do this, I just burst out laughing. And I thought somebody had actually paid him to give me a welcome to Hampshire joke, because I couldn't even imagine that this made any sense, or that there was such a thing as medieval Tibetan epistemology. But he assured me, he said, look, there's this guy up the road at Amherst College, Bob Thurman, who of course is a great scholar of Indo-Tibetan Buddhist philosophy. He said, he'll keep me honest on the um, Tibetan philosophy. I just want you to be, read Locke and Rousseau with me. You can read Locke and Rousseau, can't you? And I said, yeah, I could read Locke and Rousseau. And I thought it was a bad idea to begin my teaching career by saying no to somebody. So that even though I really knew nothing whatsoever about Tibetan epistemology and had never heard of it, I said, sure, I would do this since I knew that there was an expert on the, um, on the scene who could help with that side. But of course, if I was helping to direct this young man's thesis, I had to read what he was reading. And what he was reading were actually the rough drafts of Bob Thurman's translation of Tsongkhapa's great treatise on hermeneutics called The Essence of Eloquence. Um, and that is an extremely technical, very difficult uh, text on how Majamikas can read the Samdina Mochina Sutra, the Sutra Unraveling the Thought. It's a, it presupposes a, an enormous textual background in Indian and Tibetan um, epistemology, uh, metaphysics, and, and literature. So I was really struggling. And of course, this was also really the first major Tibetan um, 
treatise that anybody had tried to translate into English. So it was difficult. And I was reading rough drafts and I, I found it really hard. <laughs> but I understood a little bit of it, but not a whole lot. But I found it fascinating. But anyway, he finished his thesis and I put that down because I had a career to get going in logic and cognitive science, which is what my specialties are in Western philosophy. And I didn't have any time to think about medieval Tibetan epistemology after that was done. But then seven years later, there was a big debate at our college and I was happily on the losing side. I'm so very sorry that I advocated for the position that I did, but I'm glad that I lost. And it was over a new curricular requirement for our students. And the requirement was really simple, that no matter what subject a student was studying, no matter what their major, they have to pursue the way that it's addressed in some non-Western tradition. They can't just study a discipline, say, the way white people study it. So whether it's physics or art history or philosophy or chemistry, you can't just do the European version. And that requirement passed, the faculty passed this. And so the college turned around to the faculty and said, well, we can't require students to study things we don't teach. So everybody has to either retool or resign. You've either got to develop a teaching competence in some non-Western part of your discipline or leave. Um, so I kind of panicked. I didn't know anything about any non-Western tradition in philosophy, which of course was one of the reasons that I opposed it. Um, and I just thought, well, what can I do? And then I remembered seven years ago, medieval Tibetan epistemology. That was kind of interesting. I could learn enough about that maybe to um, add a week to my epistemology class on Tibetan epistemology. So I applied for a grant to retool because the college made a lot of money available to do this. And I essentially hired Bob Thurman over the summer to teach me enough Tibetan epistemology that I could do a week in my epistemology class. And I figured then I will have paid my debt to society. So I did that and it was actually really fun and the students loved it. So the next year I applied for a bigger grant to develop a comparative epistemology class and to learn a little bit more about Buddhist epistemology. And gosh, that was even more fun. Um, and students were enjoying it even more. And I found that I was actually getting interested in this material. And I realized very quickly um, that there wasn't a lot of material translated into English from the Indian and Tibetan Buddhist traditions. And so I constantly kept running into situations where I'd be reading something and they'd refer to some other text. And I'd call my friend Bob Thurman up on the phone and say, hey, Bob, this text referring to the Buddha Polita, do you have a copy of that? And he'd say, sure I do, Jay, but it's only available in Tibetan. I'd say, oh, damn. Bob, this other text is being cited. It's the Pramanavartika. Do you have a copy of it? Yes, but it's only available in Tibetan. And so I realized that if I was going to go and get anywhere in this field, I had to start learning some Tibetan. So I started learning a little Tibetan, and that was difficult but interesting. Um, and I had a sabbatical coming up. Oh, before that, there was a great, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities offered a summer seminar on Nagarjuna um, in Hawaii. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool to, you know, study Nagarjuna with a bunch of experts in Hawaii? And I thought, I'll never get accepted to this, but why not apply? So I applied and I was accepted and I went off to Hawaii and spent a wonderful summer studying Nagarjuna and my interest got deeper and deeper. And so then I had a sabbatical coming up and I asked everybody, if you're really serious about learning Indian and Tibetan Buddhist philosophy, and if you're really serious about getting Tibetan language, under your belt, where do you go? And everybody said the same thing. You go to India, to the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies and try to study there. So I applied for a grant to go to India. To my astonishment, we received the grant. Our family picked up and went off to India for a year to the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, where I studied Madhyamaka and Yogacara with the great Geshe Yeshe And I never looked back. And so that's kind of how I backed into this field. It wasn't because I was trained to do it. It was because students were interested and the college wanted us to retrain and I kind of followed those pressures and got hooked. So that's how I got. It, it's beautiful. So technically, are you 
just a scholar or are you considered a Buddhist then? Um, okay, I'll tell you a story about that as well. <laughs> um, about 20 years ago, we invited His Holiness the Dalai Lama to Smith College for a visit. And um, he came. And one of the things that he did was to offer a seminar for faculty members in Buddhist studies in our five college community and the consortium in, in which our college functions. And there were about 20 or 25 professors of Buddhist studies around a big table with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And he began the uh, seminar this way. He asked, how many of you, when you teach Buddhist philosophy or Buddhist studies, are asked by your students, are you a Buddhist? And of course, every hand went up. And then he said, now here's the question I really want to ask. How many of you answer that question? And about half of the hands went up. And he advised, he said, I do not think you should answer that question. And here's why. Suppose there are students in your class who are Buddhist, and you say that you're a non-Buddhist. They're going to say, oh, this person doesn't have any authority to teach me, and they're not going to listen to you, and you'll be less effective as a teacher, and they will learn less. Or suppose you have non-Buddhists in your class, and you say that you're a Buddhist. They will be afraid that you're trying to proselytize them and convert them, and they won't listen to what you have to say, and you'll be less effective, and they won't learn as much. Your job is to teach students, not to proselytize them, um, not to make them feel uncomfortable. So my advice, he said, is never answer that question. Um, they're there <laughs> to learn from you and you're there to teach and it's none of their business what your religious practice is. And then he said, I try to do the same thing, but nobody ever believes me. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just simply follow the advice of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and to say, whatever my personal um, beliefs are, have absolutely nothing to do with what I'm doing professionally in studying and teaching uh, Buddhist philosophy. In Madhyamaka, it's known for its radical metaphysical disconstructions, both self and consciousness. Could you begin by outlining how this tradition conceptualized consciousness, particularly in relation to its critique of inherent existence? So a central theme in Madhyamaka philosophy is the doctrine of the two truths, um, conventional truth and an ultimate truth. And this is um, a doctrine that's um, developed in detail by the second century philosopher Nagarjuna, and then by his commentators, Buddhapalata, Bhavaveka, Chandrakirti, and so on. Um, and the fundamental idea is this, that there's a conventional reality in which we live and conventional truths about that. And that conventional reality has peoples and tables and chairs and dogs and cats and trees and everything else that we have around us, as well as things like atoms and molecules and wind and, you know, all of that stuff and a mind and conscious thoughts and so forth. Um, there's things that it doesn't have, right? Santa Claus turns out not to even be conventionally real um, and unicorns aren't conventionally real. Um, so it doesn't mean that everything that we just dream up is real, but there's a, a, a reality on which we can agree. Um, there's also um, an ultimate truth, but the ultimate truth um, is that everything that exists is empty of any intrinsic reality. That is that nothing exists on its own, independently or substantially. Um, and the, and the, idea that it that it does is something that we continually carry with us that when we look at the conventional world we habitually superimpose intrinsic identity on things so when we see objects in the world or states of our own mind we think of them as existing independently when in fact every one of them exists only interdependently or conventionally and that interdependence has three dimensions to it there's causal interdependence. Everything that we encounter depends upon causes and conditions. None of it exists causelessly or just on its own. There's myriological interdependence. That is every complex that we see exists in dependence upon its parts. And every part that we see exists only in interdependence on the holes in which it figures. And finally, there's conceptual in, um, interdependence. 
that is, the phenomena that we encounter exist as the kinds of things they are, only in virtue of the structure of our perceptual and cognitive apparatus. We can only see things and conceive things as they show up for our perceptual capacities and in our conceptual scheme. Now, once we appreciate that, we come to recognize that the world we inhabit isn't a world that we just encounter, but a world that we're constantly actively constructing in interaction with the phenomena around us, conditioned by our previous cognitive activity and having as consequences all of the kinds of things that happen to us and that we experience later on. And that all of this is happening in the context of many, many of us co-constituting this reality. So when we say that the conventional world is empty of intrinsic reality, we're not saying that it's non-existent. Rather, we're saying that the way that it exists is conventionally and interdependently. That's the first thing to say. Now, when we think about things in the context of the doctrine of the two truths, one of the kinds of phenomena that we tend to reify most easily and most reflexively are our own minds or our own personal um, existence. And that can take the form of thinking of myself as a self as opposed to a person. And of course, Buddhism in all of its traditions is well known as the doctrine of no self or selflessness. In Sanskrit, we say anatman. And what that means is that when we reflexively think of ourselves as being selves, that thing called a self doesn't exist at all. Something that underlies our mental states, that underlies our body, that's the owner of our mind and our body, that we reflexively think of ourselves as kind of standing behind all of this. That's just a fiction. Instead, what we are are persons. That is causally interdependent sequences of psychophysical states that are in constant causal interaction with everything around us. And we mistake that flow of psychophysical processes for a substantial underlying self. Similarly, while it might well be true, and it is true, that conventionally we have lots of conscious states. So for instance, right now, I'm conscious of the question that you asked me. I'm looking at you on the screen and conscious of what you of, of what you look like and that you're nodding and listening and so forth. I'm conscious of a world around me in my room and so forth. To say that in order for there to be conscious states, there has to be some substantial thing called a consciousness behind them is a deep mistake. Instead, there's a flow of conscious states each one of which is generated by countless causes and conditions, and that generates further downstream effects. But we can talk about being conscious without talking about a thing called consciousness. One way of thinking about all of but uh, the import of all of this is that Madhyamaka Buddhist philosophy is constantly reminding us of an innate reflex to reify everything around us, to make it seem more solid, more essential, more substantial, more independent than it is. And that applies to things outside of our psycho psychophysical stream, like apples and trees and dogs and cats, but it also applies, and perhaps most poignantly, to what we are ourselves, and so to hypostasize selves or consciousnesses or minds, where all there are, are sequences of psychophysical processes. So Professor Garfield, as you talked about ultimate and conventional reality, uh, do you see, uh, even ultimate reality is said as empty, you know, emptiness being empty of itself. So right. uh, what will be the, uh, you know, distinguish and conventional reality is also, you know, said in the same way. So what is the distinguishing line between ultimate and conventional reality? What is one thing that you would say? You know, oh, that's, that's a wonderful question. Thank you so much for that. So you're right. And I first want to emphasize the depth of the premise of your question. Um, some people think of the distinction between conventional reality and emptiness 
as being the distinction between things that appear to exist but don't and complete non-existence. And so they think that when we say that the ultimate reality of things is their emptiness, that we're saying that things only appear to exist but don't, and ultimately there is nothing. That's a mistake. To do that is to deprecate the conventional world and to reify emptiness. So Nagarjuna puts it very beautifully like this in the 24th chapter of the Fundamental Verses on the Middle Way, Mula Majimika Karika. He says the Buddhist teaching is based upon two truths, a truth of worldly convention and ultimate truth. And if you don't understand the difference between the two truths, you're not going to understand the Buddha's teaching. Because you can only understand the ultimate truth in dependence on the conventional truth. And only if you understand the ultimate truth do you gain liberation. So he begins, this is the first half of the answer to your question, by distinguishing the two truths and saying that the conventional truth is importantly different from the ultimate truth. And one way we can understand that difference is that the conventional truth that, we, that appears to us is a positive um, phenomenon. Um, so dogs, cats, tables and chairs, apples and oranges, peaches and pears, um, all of those are um, positive things that appear to our senses um, and with which we interact in order to, for our daily life to work. And again, if you say those things don't exist, you're in big trouble. You won't be able to eat, you won't be able to make tea, you won't be able to walk down the street, and you certainly won't be able to talk about, think about, or reason your way into emptiness. That's, the, that's a really important point. It, you can't just jettison the conventional truth and keep the ultimate. But the ultimate truth about those things is a negative fact. It's the fact that they have no intrinsic reality. They exist only conventionally. So one way to put this is, the ultimate truth is that every, of anything is that it exists only conventionally. So one way to put this point, another way to put this point is, if you don't have tables, you don't have the emptiness of tables. If you don't have chairs, you don't have the emptiness of chairs. You can't say, you keep the apple, but hand me its emptiness. Or let's get rid of the apple, but keep its emptiness. The ultimate truth of things is an aspect of those things, and it's a negative aspect of those things. It's the pure absence of any intrinsic identity without the positive presence of anything else. So when we say that emptiness is empty, just as conventional phenomena are empty, we say that when we look for emptiness as a positive phenomenon, there is no such thing. There's just the absence of any positive thing, of any, of any substance or essence. Nagarjuna's commentator, Chandrakirti, who lived in the seventh century, makes that point beautifully by using a fun example. He says, Empty, to say that emptiness is a thing, if you think that it's a positive thing besides conventional phenomena, is absolutely crazy. And he says it would be like this. Suppose you went into a shop and you wanted to buy something. And the shopkeeper points to the empty shelves and says, sorry, I have nothing to sell you. And you say, that's great. I'd like three of those nothings, please. Um, Chandra Kirti says, what would you possibly buy? How crazy would that be? To say that emptiness is a positive thing that you could then apprehend, as opposed to the mere absence of intrinsic identity, and would be like saying, I'll have three of those nothings that you've got. So the sense in which conventional reality and ultimate reality are one, which Nagarjuna also asserts when he says, whatever is dependent origination we explain to be emptiness, that being a de dependent designation is the middle way, is to say that there's no substantial difference between the conventional and the ultimate uh, world. That is, ultimate reality is always the ultimate reality of some conventionally existent thing. Emptiness is always the emptiness of some interdependently existent object. But that's what the sense in which they're the same. The important sense in which they're different 
Is it conventional reality of things? Is there a positive aspect as they appear as objects to our consciousness or as subjective states? Their emptiness is the absence of any intrinsic identity in them. This consciousness is uh, from the Shanavangur Vat, like it is uh, discontinuous. Uh, so would you like to say that, uh, or uh, understand it this way, that the memory doesn't lies in the uh, uh, consciousness? But again, if memory doesn't lies in the consciousness, uh, where does it exactly lies? Uh, and uh, this is a, not a new question. I, I think so you're aware of it. So uh, how will we uh, tackle this question? Um, thank you for that question. If I understand it correctly, you're raising the question um, that some Pramanavadans um, raise for Majamikas, but is also raised by um, some Advaita Vedanta philosophers um, for Majamikas. And that's the question. If we think about um, our mental life simply as a continuum of causally related states, how do we account for um, memory? Um, because it sounds like memory um, is the preservation of a past perception someplace, like in consciousness. And if there is no such consciousness, how do we preserve that past state in order to remember it now? Is that the question? I think we can answer that question pretty directly. And here I'm, I'm simply trading on Chandrakirti's approach to answering this question. But it's, uh, I think, a perfectly, perfectly good approach. Notice that the question presupposes that when I remember something that occurred before, that somehow that past experience has been preserved and then is being recalled or reactivated now. That's actually a misleading um, understanding of how memory works. And Chandrakirti's explanation and Shantideva's explanation a bit later of how memory works is in fact exactly the way that contemporary cognitive psychologists tell us the way that memory works. We don't have the preservation of an experience in the past. Rather, an experience in the past causes a sequence of psychophysical processes. And our memory right now is an effect of that, a downstream effect of that sequence of psychophysical processes, not a photograph that's somehow been stored in our brain or a video recording stored in our brain that's then replayed. That's why, for instance, when people remember things, they um, often we discover that what they claim to remember is in fact very different from what happened at the time. That's also why sometimes we forget things um, or create um, confabulate memory and imagination. So you don't have um, something that's preserved in memory. Rather, in memory, what we have is a contemporary cognition that is the downstream effect of a cognition that happened long ago. And for that reason, you don't need a substance or a substratum like a consciousness in order to retain and file photographs or videos in order to replay them in memory. All you need is a causally intact sequence of psychophysical states. So think about it by analogy this way. Suppose you line up a whole lot of dominoes and then you knock the first one over. When the 45th domino falls, you don't ask, what is it about that first domino that was preserved in every one of those dominoes and is now being replayed in the 45th domino? Instead, you have a series of effects of that initial domino falling that is represented in the 45th domino falling. And that, that's the way memory looks. So you don't need a substantive basis for memory in order to explain it. Indeed, we often take ourselves to have such a substantive basis, but that's the illusion of self. And exactly what Buddhism is posed against is that illusion of self, trying to replace it with a clearer doctrine of no self. Uh, Dr. Garfield, I just wanted to ask about, because you just gave an example of these dominoes, for instance, because I was interested in what is it that catalyzes this causal chain, if you will, or these causal relationships. And and so the other part of that question would be, 
are is this emptiness and the causal phenomena are they related in some way um this no. this is what i want to check like you yeah. talk about the domino so what is it that makes the first domino fall let's say that well buddhist philosophers tend to think that there is no first domino um that this causal process has been going on um in for beginningless time um and one way to think about that is that you know we don't look for a cause for everything we look for a cause for each thing um contemporary physics um you know uh, tells us that the universe began in a big bang there was nothing before that that caused it the big bang brings time itself into existence and once time is in existence causal processes begin um but we don't need to point to any first cause for anything as long as there's been time there's been causes and effects well, professor yogacharya and madhyamaka both reject the existence of a permanent cell but yogacharya introductions of alaya vijnana provide a more structured account of consciousness so my question is in your view what is the philosophical tension between these two school because th the group tends to ask these two questions so i'm just presented it to you it might sound a bit broad so mm -hmm. are these approaches fundamentally different or could they be seen as addressing complementary aspect of the, the the same issue they want to know i think they're completely complementary and not at all inconsistent with one another um and i think that's really important to see so let me preface that by saying that the yogacara tradition is huge and extremely internally diverse and there are many philosophical strands within the yogacara tradition and very often people will pick one particular idea and say this is what yogacara is this is what yogacara is this is what yogacara is um and very often that's they pick the idealist strains within yogacara i do think there are tensions between idealism and madhyamaka but idealism isn't essential to yogacara it's not the central idea it's something that it's one stream of yogacara and thought um so i'm going to give you a different perspective on the relationship between yogacara and madhyamaka than the rivalry perspective that is often presented and this perspective i actually encountered first in a talk that his holiness the dalai lama gave in new delhi about maybe 25 years ago i'm not sure exactly but roughly then but i learned afterwards as i sort of did further research that he was actually channeling a much longer tradition that actually begins um with the 14th century tibetan philosopher rongtong um and that is a tradition of seeing these as um as very complementary so here's a way to think about this first of all yogacara what's really um the core of yogacara and thought i think the core of yogacara and thought are the doctrine of the three natures and the three naturelessnesses so when we understand that each phenomenon has an imagined nature a parakalpata swabhava that each phenomenon has an interdependent nature paratantra swabhava and that each depart each phenomenon has a consummate nature a paranishpana swabhava that every phenomenon is empty in three aspects empty with empty with respect to characteristics empty with respect to causation and ultimately empty and to understand the way in which those three naturelessnesses pair with the three natures corresponding to um to the imagined nature is emptiness with respect to characteristic corresponding to the dependent nature is emptiness with respect to causation and corresponding to the uh, consummate nature is ultimate emptiness that's really the core of yogacara and we can see that because that's really what we find presented in the samdhina mochana sutra especially in the 7th chapter the questions of paramartha samadgata now how do we put madhyamaka and yogacara together here's how rongtong does it and i think it's quite beautiful he says that madhyamaka teaches emptiness 
from the side of the object of knowledge. When we understand emptiness in Madhyamaka, we pay attention to th objects, to things, and ask what is it that to superimpose intrinsic identity on this thing? What is the absence of intrinsic identity in this thing? And so we use forms of argument that reduce to absurdity the idea that things have intrinsic identity and to demonstrate that they're emptiness of any, uh, empty of any intrinsic nature. Um, and hence that, they're, that uh, their ultimate nature is emptiness. When we do that, we're always focusing on the things we experience, even when we're focusing on the person or the self. We're asking, what is, what is it that makes the, the, the me that I experience empty? So turning myself into an object and analyzing that. And these arguments and these analyses are very profound and they're very important. Yeah. Yogacara is addressing emptiness from the side of the subject of experience. So it's asking the following very difficult question. Given that everything is empty, how is it that we manage to superimpose intrinsic identity on phenomena that lack them? What are the nature of our cognitive processes and our subjectivity in virtue of which we manage to get so completely confused about the nature of the world to confuse empty phenomena with non-empty phenomena and to experience a world of non-empty phenomena. So we can, if we explore how that works, we can understand both the roles of the three natures and three naturelessnesses and of the Alaya Vijnana in that process. So <clears throat> Yogacara is asking how we manage to do this subjectively. So one way to do this, and, and so because it's doing this, Yogacharan thought is much more psychological and much more phenomenological than Madhyamaka thought. One way to think about this is that Madhyamaka is doing the metaphysics and Yogacara is doing the phenomenology that allows us to um, understand how we experience a world whose metaphysical reality is delivered by Madhyamaka. So, Let's imagine an object um, that we're going to all, all see together. Um, suppose that you've got um, an apple on your desk or an apple in your room. If you don't have an apple, you have to imagine one. Um, the apple that I see um, presents itself as very red and smooth and shiny and tastes very sweet if I bite into it. And it smells very sweet right now on my desk. It makes me tempted to bite into it, but I'm not going to. Um, so now I want you to imagine that it's not you seeing the apple, but suppose it's a bee or another kind of insect in your room who sees the apple. One of the interesting things about bees is that they don't only see in the same wavelength range of light that we do. They also see in the ultraviolet and the infrared. So the apple doesn't look red to the bee. The apple is going to have a remarkable range of colors that we can't even see. Bees are also sensitive to magnetic fields. And so if the apple's got a magnetic field, it appears with that magnetic field. Bees have complicated compound eyes. So the image they're seeing is an image seen from many perspectives at once, unlike ours. Now, if you were to ask yourself, if, oh, and let's also imagine that you've got a dog in your room. I have one in my room. He's fast asleep behind me. Um, he doesn't see um, reds very well at all. Dogs see yellows and greens, okay, but not reds. So when he sees the apple, he probably sees it as sort of a grayish or greenish color. So he sees it very differently, but he has a much more acute sense of smell than I do or the bee. So what he actually experiences is a volume of smell that looks kind of grayish greenish, whereas I see a red object that happens to have a sweet smell. There's three really different ways of experiencing the apple. Now ask yourself the following question. And the moment you ask it, you're going to realize how stupid it is. The question is, who's right about how the apple appears? Is it me, the bee, or the dog? The moment you ask that question, you realize that it's dumb. It's, I don't want to say, I get it right, and bees see everything wrong. Or bees really get reality right, but human beings don't. That doesn't even make any sense. There's the apple as it shows up for the bee, 
in perception. There's the apple as it shows up for me in perception. There's the apple as it shows up for my dog in perception. And then if you ask the really dumb question, yeah, 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 but what does the app, how does the apple appear just on its own, regardless of whether you're a bee, a person, or a dog, then you're really stupid, right? But what you realize when you ask that question is, there is no way the apple just appears, only a way it appears to a particular subjectivity. When you realize that, that there is no actual perceptible characteristic that the apple has, you realize that the apple is empty with respect to characteristics. And that's the first of the three emptinesses in Yogacara. Okay, so we've recognized that the apple is empty with respect to characteristic. Now, if we continue on this story, and we ask, yeah, 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 but how does the apple appear so sweet and smooth and red to me right now? Now I can tell a story, and it's a very natural story. Light bounces off that apple. Um, various aromatic compounds are evaporating from that apple. The light enters my eye through the pupil, is refracted and turned upside down through jelly in my eye, causes photoelectric effects on the back of my Retina sends electrical impulses through two different pathways to the back of my brain and a bunch of electrical stuff happens in the occipital cortex. That's how I see it. And then I could tell a similar story about olfaction and, and gustatory stuff. Notice that none of that electrical stuff that's happening looks anything like an apple or smells anything like an apple. I hope it doesn't or I'm in big trouble, right? There's no apple in my skull or I'm in very big trouble. So what I experience as this red, shiny, smooth thing is really a complex set of causal processes. Now, the Yogacharans didn't talk about occipital cortices and retinas, but they did talk about all of the minute cognitive, um, cognitive and memory processes involved in perception and pointed out that that's really what's happening. So when we say that, we've recognized that the apple is empty with respect to causation. That is, there's no apple in all of those causal processes. Those causal processes lack an apple, but they're confused for an apple through this imaginative projection um, and as this red shiny thing. Then we ask the question, so that's the second of the three emptinesses. Um, the third of the three emptinesses is ultimate emptiness. So we're now asking the question, okay, so where is the apple in all of this, co in this cognitive process? And the answer is, is nowhere. There isn't an apple there at all. All there is, is a complicated interaction between me my, um, and phenomena around me that's experienced as an apple. And that is the ultimate emptiness of the apple. That gives us the three emptinesses. Notice that each of those is characterized purely phenomenologically. But now the beauty of Yogacara is we can turn those three emptinesses around into three characteristics of the apple. So we can say, oh, the apple has an imagined nature. There's a way that I imagine the apple and a way that bees imagine the apple a way that dogs imagine the apple, and so forth. We imagine the apple to be an external object, dually related to subjectivity, that we simply happen to encounter as it is, and imagine that our subjectivity is just this kind of recording device that perfectly gives us the way the world is antecedently. That's stupid, but that is the way we reflexively imagine the world around us. The 20th century German philosopher Edmund Husserl called that the natural attitude. Our natural attitude towards the world is, here we are as perfectly experiencing subjects, just detecting properties that are already there in the world, where in fact we're constructing them all the time. So that's the first nature of the apple, the imagined nature. There's also the dependent nature of the apple. The apple that I experience, the red smooth sweet thing, only emerges depend in dependence on countless causes and conditions, most of which are psychological. And the dependent nature of the apple is that the thing I experience, that imagined apple, is something that depends for its existence on all of these causal processes. And then there's the consummate nature of the apple. 
That is that that dependent nature is empty of anything red, shiny, and sweet. There's nothing red, shiny, or sweet in my head, that it's empty of all of that. And that's the consummate nature of the apple, that the dependent is empty of the imagined. Now, those three emptinesses that we, um, or those three natures, map onto those three emptinesses, right? So the emptiness with respect to characteristic maps onto the, maps onto the imagined nature. The emptiness with respect to causation maps onto the dependent nature. And the consummate, the ultimate emptiness maps on to the consummate nature. And all of that gives us a detailed phenomenological and psychological explanation of how we construct this empty world around us, and that and in virtue of which it is completely empty. There's nothing in that story inconsistent with Madhyamaka. It's just the phenomenological side of Madhyamaka. Now, the Ali of Vinyana, last piece of the puzzle, um, this foundation consciousness. Part of the genius of Yogacara is that it's really the first philosophical system in the world that really discovered the profound importance of unconscious psychological processes to understanding our cognition. And so when you think about the Ali of Vinyana, even though it's generally translated as foundation consciousness, it, must, it may be better to understand it as the fundamental unconscious or the pre-conscious, or as I like to put it, just non-introspectable foundational psychophysical processes. Um, Freud had this idea a few thousand years later. Um, but the Yogacharan idea is that if we want to understand how our introspectable cognitive life emerges, a life that's got apples and tables and dogs and cats and bees, we have to understand that the causes of all of that are things to which we don't have any access. All of those processes that psychologists tell us about, neuroscientists tell us about. And the Ali of Vinyana is that flow of unconscious processes and when those, um, and what those do is produce the Yogacharana metaphor is to ripen, that they're seeds or potentials that ripen as cognitive processes. And whenever they emerge into conscious, introspectable um, experience, they always emerge in a dual aspect, a subjective aspect and an objective aspect. So when my ability to perceive the apple happens, I experience me as a subject, perceiving the apple as an object. And it's not as though first I emerge as a subject with no object, or first it emerges as an object and then I get posited as a subject. But there's a co-emergence of subjectivity and objectivity that gives our experience the appearance of subject-object duality. But that appearance of subject-object duality is just that. It's an appearance that is actually the maturation or the, um, the evolution of a fundamentally non-dual, non-introspectable set of psychological processes, namely the Alia Vijnana. And that's why where Madhyamaka says that things are empty of intrinsic nature, Yogacharans say, no, the fundamental thing that they're empty of is subject-object duality, and that that can be understood in terms of these three aspects of emptiness. Emptiness with respect to characteristic, with respect to production, and ultimate emptiness. Again, that's not inconsistent with Madhyamaka. It's giving a phenomenological understanding of the metaphysical picture that Madhyamaka sketches. It's quite a complex system to understand because of the way they're using dialectical languages. And that's the way you you, you clarify it. It's synced in to me now because sure. before I'm categorizing it, I have these categorizing saying this is an idealist frame of mm -hmm. work and this is a Madhyamaka frame of work. So I'm seeing two separate uh, literature of it. But when you combine them together, I hear it now. That that yep. is a phenomenological side of it, and that's the the broader metaphysical side of it. So this is beautiful. 
tremendously explained, you know, Yogachara. I have a question uh, that recent researches on uh, Sandhi Nirmochana Sutra and uh, uh, Maya Jala Sutra especially, they say that uh, there was gradual development of Yogachara Buddhism, uh, yeah. you know, especially. So, so what is your views on that? Like, how would you, you know, say oh, yes. the gradual development of Yogachara with the gradual development of Madhyamika? Yeah, I, I think both of these um, traditions develop gradually. Um, it's easy for us, and this is, I think, a really um, important kind of hermeneutical mistake that often gets made by contemporary readers when we read classical um, Indian philosophical literature. Um, it's the model of authorship um, that we impose. So these days, I mean, like the 21st century, um, if I write a book, I write it at a particular time over a period of a certain number of years. If my name appears on the cover or if my name and two of my colleagues' names appear on the cover or my name and nine of my colleagues co appear on the cover, you assume that we wrote that book during that particular time frame. And when people refer to that book, they can open it up and say, this is the book that Garfield and his colleagues wrote. And it's easy to superimpose that model of authorship on a classical period where that if that did happen, it was probably the exception rather than the rule. So most of the texts that we have are texts that evolved over time that were written by committees of authors rather than single authors. And those committees may have existed over many years. So for instance, um, if we look at, and this is certainly true more, uh, or let me say, it's more plausibly true of Mahayana Sutra literature than Shastra literature, but it's true of both. Um, so for instance, if we look at uh, Shanti Deva's Bodhicharya Avatara, which is a, a classic example of that, um, we know that that text evolved for at least a couple of hundred years. And we can, we've got manuscripts from different periods where different parts of the text are transposed and moved and material is added to it. And so the text that we have um, is a fairly late version. And I, and I like to say that what that means is it's the final draft. It wasn't a rough draft. Um, and we can think about these texts as evolving from rough drafts into final drafts. Um, now the sutras that we have, and I would say those include the Prajnaparamita Sutras, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras that represent the foundation of the Madhyamaka school, as well as the Sandhina Mochana and the Lankavatara and sutras like that, that represent the sutra foundation of the Yogacara school. <clears throat> those don't have authors attached to them at all, right? They're allegedly the word of the Buddha, Buddha Vachana. Um, but of course, the historical Buddha was dead for 500 to 800 years prior to the composition of any of these sutras. So if we're being realistic, and these are written in Sanskrit, right? They're not written in, in uh, Pali or any other proper language, um, like the, um, like the uh, Theravada or the, uh, the, the Primahayana canon. So we have to um, take very seriously the fact that um, we don't know who wrote these texts, but also that when we look at the, at the texts themselves, they provide a lot of evidence of editing, re-editing, um, and evolution over time from rough drafts to the final canonical drafts that we have. And sometimes, again, if we look at um, translations of these texts or manuscripts of these texts that are found in different places, whether they're found in Silk Grove Caves in Dunhuang or Torfan, or whether they're found in Tibetan monasteries or, or elsewhere or in Chinese translations, we see that people are working from different editions um, with, with different versions of the texts. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, we just can't superimpose the model of authorship that we have of contemporary literature on classical literature. Now, in the case of Yogacara, which is what you asked about, the, um, the Yogacaran tradition was a, a viable and dominant tradition in India from about the 3rd century to about the 11th century. So that's about 800 years. 800 years is a really long time. Um, I want you to sort of think about that. That's like from the 1300s till now, okay? Um, so that's a long time. And you expect that any intellectual tradition is going to develop 
um, over those times. Western philosophy and its systems developed a lot over those times. Um, and we don't want to say, gee, if you really want to understand logic, look at 14th century logic, not 21st century logic. Um, if you really want to understand idealism, look at 14th century idealism, not 21st century idealism. We say, let's look at the history and development of these strains of thought in Western philosophy over time. And we have to be willing to do the same thing for Indian philosophy in general, for Buddhist philosophy in particular, for Yogacara philosophy in very particular. And these philosophical systems were evolving not only in an eternal dynamic, but in interaction with other systems. So Yogacharans were talking to Majamikas. They were talking to non-Mahayana Buddhist philosophers. They were talking to Vedantins. They were talking to Nihayakas. They were talking to Mimamsakas. And so there were all of these different debates going on to Kashmiri Shaivas. So there were all these different debates going on. And each of these schools was developing in response to the others. This was a living, active, intellectual tradition. And that's why it's really helpful to do textual history in order to figure out what was going on. And when we look at some of these debates, we get beautiful insights into how these people were thinking, into what kinds of um, theories were in play, and also into the degree to which 21st century Western philosophical debates often recapitulate classical Indian debates or classical Tibetan debates. And we could say the same thing about Tibet, you know, philosophy in Tibet evolved an awful lot from the early transmissions in uh, the eighth and ninth centuries up through the later transmissions and then the autonomous philosophical scholastic traditions that really got going in the 10th and 11th centuries and went further. Thank you. So you have to think historically. Yeah, one quick follow-up. So, uh, in light of you know uh, Madhimika and Yogacara, where do you see the school of Buddha nature, Tathagata Garbha, aligning with? Is it more towards Yogacara? Um, Tathagata Garbha thought developed primarily in the Yogacara tradition. That's not to say there were no Majamikas who um, referred to Tathagata Garbha, but the, you should also recognize, and really important, that when we talk about evolution and, and dissension, there are a lot of different interpretations of the Tagata Garbha thought, both within uh, in, within India, in Tibet, and in China. Um, and it's not a single strain of thought. So sometimes the Tagata Garbha gets represented as a kind of kind of essence or kind of um, nature that that um, sentient beings have, and then it begins to sound an awful lot like um, a kind of reintroduction of self. And that gets criticized by some, by some Buddhist philosophers. Um, but sometimes it's merely referring to the potential that beings have for Buddhahood. Um, so it becomes something much lighter. And sometimes it's somewhere in between. But it's certainly true historically that Tathagata Garbha develops primarily in the context of Yogacara thought. Hi, Jay, first of all, big fan. And uh, my question is that, there is this particular verse in Mul Madhyama Karika, uh, chapter 25, verse number 19. It basically says that there is no distinction between Nirvana and Samsara. Can you explain yeah. this thing? I can. I think it's a beautiful verse. And so not even the subtlest something in between them, right? There's not even the subtlest difference. So I think it's useful to explain 2519 um, in the context of 2418. Um so at 2418, which I've um, already uh, quoted, but I didn't, I didn't identify, Nagarjuna says, whatever is dependent origination is explained to be emptiness. That being a dependent designation is itself the middle way. And there what Nagarjuna is saying is, and we use the language of um, Tsongkhapa here. Um, Tsongkhapa is a, a 14th, 15th century Tibetan commentator. And commenting on that verse, he says, that um, conventional reality and ultimate reality are, dis, uh, are extensionally equivalent and intentionally distinct. That is, they're the same thing from, a, from a, an ontological point of view, but they're distinct from the standpoint of how they're understood. Um, and here's a let me give you an analogy there, and then I will come to 2519, but I think that talking about 2418 provides the, the relevant context. Um, suppose, um, gee, I want a really good example here that isn't, okay, yeah. Um, 
King Charles. Um, let's talk about Charles for a while. I used to always do this with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth because it was so, so easy. Actually, let me do that with Her Majesty Queen, the late Queen Elizabeth, because it's easier. Okay, we could either have a we could we could have understood her as the um, monarch and head of state of the British Empire. We could also have known her as the most famous breeder of Welsh corgis in the world. Um, and you could imagine going to um, uh, going and seeing um, Elizabeth um, walking all of these corgis and saying, there goes the woman who's the most famous breeder of Welsh corgis in the world. And somebody says, do you know that she's also the, the monarch of Great Britain? And then you say, no, 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 she's just an old lady who breeds Welsh corgis. Or somebody who looks at Queen Elizabeth addressing Parliament and says, you know that she's actually also the most famous breeder of Welsh corgis? And you'd say, oh, come on, she's the queen. She doesn't have any time for that. But indeed, she was both, right? Um, and so these are two different ways of understanding who she was. Um, but it was the same person. It wasn't as though there were two people in one body. There was one person who could appear in two different ways, either as a monarch or as a breeder of Welsh corgis. Similarly, Nagarjun is pointing out, there aren't two realities, conventional reality and ultimate reality. Instead, there's one reality that can be understood as it is conventionally when we simply apprehend dependently originated phenomena, or could be understand to be emptiness when we apprehend ultimate reality. But it's the same reality. Now, nirvana and samsara, same idea. We can say that nirvana and samsara represent the same reality experienced in two very different ways. Remember, nirvana um, is a cessation. The term nirvana means the extinction of flames. And the flames that we have in mind here are the flames of attraction and aversion. So that when we experience the world without suffering, we're experiencing nirvana. When we experience the world as a source of suffering, we're experiencing samsara. But that doesn't mean we're experiencing two different worlds. The difference between suffering and not suffering is on the subjective side. If we are plagued by attraction and aversion when we experience phenomena, and if, we are, if our experience of them is conditioned by the primal confusion of conventional reality with ultimate reality that grounds attraction and aversion, the primary confusion that involves the superimposition of intrinsic identity, then we're experiencing the world as samsara. But if we're experiencing the world as empty, and so have no attraction and no aversion, and so experiencing the world free from suffering, we're experiencing it as nirvana. That's not two different worlds. That's two different modes of experience just as emptiness and dependent origination are two different worlds. They're two different modes of comprehension of the same world. So this verse, 2519, is meant to caution you against thinking of samsara as, say, the world in which we're born, and nirvana as some kind of weird heaven world that we go to after death. Um, we don't go anywhere else. We stay here. The attainment of nirvana is simply the relinquishing of suffering within this very world. Does that help? Yes, yeah, very helpful. Thank you. So uh, my question is this. Uh, now, how to assimilate that concept, or is it possible to assimilate that concept of uh, uh, birth and rebirth cycle, the cycle of uh, birth and death, uh, with this concept of uh, there is no self, or in the context like there is uh, no continuous continuity of this self? Uh, and I think so. You're aware of this question, so I no need to explain it to you. So, can you just uh, like how oh, is it possible? Yes, absolutely. Because if we ask what's born and what's reborn, if we believe in literal rebirth, that is personal rebirth, then what's reborn is not a self but a person. And you can. And the important thing to see is that from this standpoint. Rebirth isn't something that only happens between death, biological death and biological birth. Rebirth is something that's happening every moment. So right now, as I'm speaking to you, the Jay Garfield who is speaking these words is not the same as the Jay Garfield who spoke the first words in this sentence. 
And I can tell you why. This Jay Garfield is older than that one. And two things that are different ages can't be the same thing. So one way to put this is that at every moment, I'm being reborn as a being with the memories of the person who existed a moment ago. That's how, how the sequence of psychophysical processes work. Now, the doctrine of personal rebirth that we find in classical India suggests that even if bodies aren't reborn across biological birth and biological death, psychological continua um, are independent of those bodies and can continue um, through that process. Many of us today don't believe that, um, and that's okay. But here's something that we do believe. Um, that just as the being I am now is the downstream consequence of the being I was when I began um, speaking this sentence, that there will be future consequences of my life even after I die. Um, my, think my thinking is that to take rebirth seriously as a psychological, as a phenomenological reality, but more importantly as the basis for moral um, thought and for um, and for conceiving of the importance of our lives. You don't have to believe that you personally will be reborn. What you have to believe in is a future. Um, and if you believe in a future and you believe that what you do now is causally efficacious in that future, then you think that the psychophysical continuum that you are now will continue after your death because part of that continuum is all of the effects of your life. The, uh, that continuum isn't just the effects of your life within a biological body. So to take my own case um, in particular, not that it's anything special, but the way that I think about that, I'm a teacher, that's my profession, that's my job. And I teach students. Um, most of those students will be alive after I die. Um, those students will know things, believe things, have developed in ways because of what I've taught them. That means that I've got a huge responsibility. If I teach them badly, I screw them up and I screw up the future of the world. If I teach them well, I might do them some benefit and benefit the future of the world. And so when I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the downstream consequences of my psychological, physical, verbal act actions. And that means I'm thinking about um, what happens in after my death as part of the psychological consequences of what I do. And that's how I understand rebirth. You know, this speaks about ultimate truth. And we look at ultimate truth as, you know, it's sort of like the enlightened perspective is, is the emptiness and the other perspective is nirvana and they're not separate. Is there um, an ontological uh, description sort of of this ultimate truth? Or is it more phenomenological in nature in, in, in these ideas? As I said earlier in talking about 2418 and 2519 of Malama Jamakarika, um, ontologically, samsara and nirvana are no different from one another. Phenomenologically, they're different. That, or the other way to put that is extensionally, they're not different, just as her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was not ontologically different from the most famous breeder of Welsh corgis in the world, um, but intentionally different. You might recognize the, the most famous uh, breeder of Welsh corgis without recognizing that she's the monarch and vice versa. Um, so ontologically, there's no difference at all. Phenomenologically, there's all the difference in the world. And one way to look at that, I mean, this is a Yogacara move. One of the other names for the Yogacara school is Chittamatra, right? Mind only. And sometimes people read that in an idealistic way as thinking that the only thing there is is mind. A colleague of mine, Dan Lusthaus, says there's a much better way to read that. He says the mind is the only thing you need to worry about. Um, you can't do a lot to change the world you can do a lot to change the way you experience the world. Um, and um, when we start looking at the relationship between samsara and nirvana, 
that's a transformation not of the world but a transformation of our minds that's changing our mind from a mind that grasps things as intrinsically existent and develops attraction and aversion to them and hence causes and experiences suffering into a mind that grasps the world as empty and hence without attachment and aversion and so no longer experiences or creates suffering. That distinction, that transformation from samsara to nirvana is not a matter of going to a different world or transforming this world. It's a matter of transforming experience. I mean, I, I don't know what that really says about ultimate truth in the sense of is there anything on that does it have consciousness does it have intelligence is it a presence i mean you know this is the kind of thing that i'm trying to trying to figure yeah. out this is yeah this is a very difficult and a very old i think a debate that has been going on i do come from a kind of vedantic background so yeah. i'm trying to understand yeah. how this would uh, you know be similar or different yeah um it's different from vedanta um but it's not it's not enormously different. Um, but I want to leave the Vedanta side aside so as not to confuse things and just to talk specifically about the Madhyamaka side. Whenever you say that something is empty, you haven't finished your sentence. You have to say empty of what? So for instance, if somebody comes into my room trying to catch a buffalo, they're going to look into the room and say, it's empty, because there are no buffalo here. Um, but if they were looking for a person or a dog, they would say the room is not empty, because there's a person and a dog in here. If after this, um, af after this little seminar, I decide to take my dog out for a walk, and we leave the room, somebody might say, oh, the room is empty now. But if they're looking for furniture, they're going to find the room isn't empty. There's a desk and chairs and things like that. Suppose somebody comes and takes all of the desk and the chairs and the pictures and the carpets and everything out and says, now the room is empty. A physicist says, no, it's not empty of air. There's plenty of air in there and so forth. So you always have to ask the question, empty of what? Now, in the Madhyamaka tradition, when we say that all phenomena are empty, we do not mean that they are empty of existence. We mean they are empty of intrinsic existence. That's why Chandrakirti and then later Tsongkhapa say that the first step in Madhyamaka analysis is identifying the object of negation, making sure that it's clear what you're denying when you say that things are empty. And if you think you're denying that they exist, you've got it really wrong. Um, what, because if you say that they don't exist, then you have to also say their emptiness doesn't exist because you can't have the emptiness of a non-existent thing. You can only have the emptiness of an existent thing. So when we say that things are empty, we mean that even though they exist, they don't exist intrinsically. That's completely consistent with and in fact is mutually entailed by saying that they exist interdependently or exist conventionally. So emptiness leaves the conventional reality of things intact and says that it's the superimposition of intrinsic reality on that which lacks it that is the fundamental primal confusion. If we were to look at this from a Yogacara perspective instead of a Madhyamaka perspective, then we might say to say that things are empty is to say that they're empty of subject-object duality. Again, not to say that they don't exist, but to say that their presentation as independently existing objects that appear to independently existing subjects is illusory, and that in fact they arise from non-dual conscious um, pro unconscious processes that are made conscious in a manifestation as subject and object or that they are empty of the imagined nature um, and, and purely interdependent um, phenomena. Notice that that is not to say that they don't exist. It's not to say that there's just a luminous consciousness. It's not to say that there's a pure absence. It's to say that things exist conventionally, but not ultimately. So it's not the same as Vedanta. 
and don't try to read it through Advaita Vedanta. Um, instead, um, understand it um, on its own terms. Uh, Jay, there is this particular verse in Dhammapada, verse number 153 and verse number 154. It basically says that Visankara Gatam Chittam. It basically says that Buddha's mind has become free from samskaras. So is it, yeah. is it the samskaras are responsible for your craving? Is this what it's trying to say? Yes. When we use the term samskara in Buddhist thought, what we mean are um, psychological dispositions, kind of innate psychological traits or processes. And when we say that the Buddha's mind is free from samskaras, what we mean is it's free from um, polluted samskaras or illusory samskaras. So that, you know, when I, we talked about the Yogacara tradition, for instance, and we said that what they're re reflecting is the fact that we innately and reflexively um, understand the world as existing in a manner that's fundamentally different from that in which it in fact exists. We're talking about sets of psychological processes that naturally deliver us a world that is illusory. Footnote here on the idea of illusion. For something to be illusory, and this is just basic kind of Sanskrit definition, um, is for it to exist in one way, but to appear in a different way. So a, re a mirage, for instance, exists as a refraction pattern, but appears to be water. A reflection in a mirror exists as a reflection, but appears to be another face, and so forth. Um, so when we say that the Buddha's samskaras have ceased, what we mean is that the dispositions that we have to experience the world as existing intrinsically no longer exist after awakening. That's what we awaken from. And that's to say that the Buddha is not sucked in by illusions as we are constantly. Uh, oh, hi, Jay. First of all, it feels uh, good to have you here. Okay, my question might sound silly, but uh, for a lay practitioner of Madhyamukha, Will they attain the highest without, without becoming a bhikshu or taking a renunciation? What does the scripture say on this? Um, the Mahayana tradition um, is kind of committed to the view that lay people um, can attain awakening as, as much as ordained people can. And I'd say the locus classicus for this is everybody's favorite Mahayana sutra, the Vimala Kirti Nirdesha Sutra. Um, Vimala Kirti is a lay person and um, has realizations that outshine those of celestial bodhisattvas. Um, so I think one of the innovations in the Mahayana tradition is opening up a practice of lay, a, a pathway of lay practice along with a bhikshu and bhikshuni um, pathway. Um, historically, this is probably because people who were, you know, contributing to monasteries wanted a piece of the action. Uh, soteriologically, and um, Buddhism, in order to grow, needed to bring lay people um, into the practice fold and into the possibility of awakening. But for whatever reason, um, it's certainly true that uh, in the Mahayana, we think of there as being a fourfold Sangha that includes not only male and female renunciants, but male and female um, lay people. Right. I just... Uh want to say something here because you mentioned Advaita Vedanta. So my question is, Shankara's Advaita Vedanta posit Brahman as mm -hmm. an ultimate and unified reality, which yep. appears similar to certain Buddhist notion of interconnectedness. But from your perspective, Professor Garfield, could it be argued that Shankara, despite his emphasis on a singular ultimate reality, unintentionally, basically, he reinforcing a form of reification that Chandrakiti, in his deconstructive approach, seek to dismantle, basically. I think that's right. I think that's the fundamental difference between Advaita Vedanta and, um, and Buddhism, is that whereas the Buddhist conception of ultimate reality is a purely negative conception, an emptiness that doesn't interpose anything else. Um, the Advaita Vedanta system um, 
provides, you know, it's a, a nirguna Brahma, but it's still a Brahma. It's still it's still a thing, um, a, a, a non-dual single reality. Um, and Buddhism is really saying, no, empty of everything, even empty of nirguna Brahman. It is regarding to the phenomenology. And uh, so usually uh, when you look at phenomenology of uh, phenomenon, uh, we also come across the noumenon. So uh, again, this question comes in like uh, if uh, the samsara is an uh, is a phenomenon. Uh, how to understand it uh, without the concept of noumena? Uh, yeah, there's no conception of noumena in in Buddhism. I mean, one way to look at that is introducing noumena are introducing things that exist independently as they are, independently of consciousness. And the Buddhist idea is you can't even make sense of that. The things only come into existence interdependently. I'm cautious about not overgeneralizing Western thought. So right. Western philosophy, consciousness is often reduced to a mechanism like the brain, the self. And then Buddha tradition offer a fluid and independent view. How can this approach address when Western concern about relativism, you know, and especially the agency? Well, Having said you weren't going to overgeneral, <laughs> you kind of did. Yeah, but I um, give the, the 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 thingy first before you know. Yeah, yeah. the air quotes don't help. They stay <laughs> generalization with air quotes. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to I'm I'm not going to talk about Western philosophy per se. I'm going to talk yeah. about the specific idea. The, the, yeah. Um, I think that a lot of contemporary debates, not all. But a lot of contemporary debates in cognitive science and in consciousness studies um, suffer from an initial illusory step. And that is one that they could have avoided if they had read their Buddhist philosophy. And it was the slide from conscious to consciousness. The moment we put that substantivizing suffix on the word conscious, we've created a thing. And now we start wondering what that thing is. Um, there's a beautiful paragraph in Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations, one of my favorite. And it's paragraph number 308. And Wittgenstein there says, you know, we began with the idea of a mechanism. And we all know what a physical mechanism is. And so then when we tried to understand thought, we said, well, it's just like a physical mechanism, only it's inside. And the moment we understand, try to understand what a physical mechanism is, except that it's not physical, he said the whole analogy falls to pieces. And then we think we can't understand thought. And I think that that's exactly what a great deal of contemporary cognitive science has done. It said, okay, I know what a physical mechanism like a computer looks like. Um, I know what a thermostat looks like. Um, the mind is just like that, only not physical. And you want to say, wait, 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 wait. It's just like a physical thing, except that it's not physical. What are you talking about? What, where is the analogy? But where the analogy is, it's the substantivizer. It's saying, it's a thing that does that. Um, now, imagine that you did the same thing. Let's try to do an analogy to understand just how dangerous that is. Suppose that you went from thinking about how financial transactions occur. How do people buy things? Well, sometimes they do it with barter, sometimes they do it with British pounds, sometimes with euros, sometimes with dollars, sometimes they do it with hard currency, sometimes they do it with a credit card, sometimes they do it with Venmo or PayPal, sometimes it's an EF, all these different ways, right? There's all these ways to do that. And you said, okay, but they all must be ways of doing the same thing. What physically is a money transfer? You want to say, wait a minute, there is no thing that a money transfer is. There's just all these different ways of doing it. There isn't any common core, um, especially not a substantial core. And you wonder, well, is that thing, is money transfer physical or is it mental or is it abstract or is it, you know, how long does it take? Or 
You want to, wrong question. You've substantivized something that isn't substantive. There are examples of me buying a, a pack of chewing gum or somebody else buying some eggs or somebody else buying shares, but there isn't a single thing called buying that we can then say, oh, is it physical or is it mental? Um, and I think the same thing goes for thought or for being conscious. When we talk about something being conscious, we're talking about a moment where that thing interacts conceptually with something else or perceptually with something else. But then to ask, well, what's that kind of thing that is consciousness that makes that, that interaction conscious? There isn't any such thing. And I think that we've just got off on the wrong foot when we ask, how does the brain produce consciousness? Or is consciousness physical? Or is consciousness non-physical? Or is consciousness universal? Or is, right? The moment we stick that ness on there, we've created a something out of nothing. And when Buddhists talk about the importance of no self and of emptiness, and the fact that the, um, the instinct to reify gets us into constant confusions, this is a beautiful example of that. And I just look forward to the point where somebody says we have to stop substantivizing. It's almost always a mistake. Wondering um, if you by any chance wanted to elaborate a little bit about the five aggregates and the different levels of consciousness? Um, the word aggregates has got a lot of, um, uh, is pretty deeply entrenched. The first thing I want to do is advocate for a new term. Okay, um, let's just take clusters. It does, it's got fewer syllables. It's a little bit less, you know, mystical. And it reminds us that what we're talking about are groups of things. And so the five psychophysical clusters are analytically useful baskets in which to put groups of disparate things. So one of those is the material, uh, that cluster of matter, sometimes again, weirdly translated as form, but of matter, of physical stuff. Part of what it is to be a human being is to have physical properties. Um, and those are physical properties like, you know, how much you weigh and what color you are and whether you're male or female and whether you've got hair or no hair and how many fingers you've got and stuff like that, all these physical processes. So part of who I am um, is my physical nature, my embodiment, my location, my age, all of that stuff. And that's what it means to say that matter is one of the psychophysical clusters. A second psychophysical cluster are sensations. And sensations are the kind of bare feelings that I have of the world. Those might be pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. They might be sensory feelings, they might be cognitive feelings, but just the basic sensory contact with the world. Um, if you don't have sensory contact with the world, then you know, you're not a psychophysical organism, right? And every organism has got some contact with the world. And so part of who I am is how I'm feeling and what I'm sensing. Then there's um, perception. Um, perception is much more than sensation because perception is always conceptually enriched. It always gives me an object. And again, as the Yogacharans point out, implicates a subject-object um, duality. So when I perceive something, I distinguish it from things around it and see it stand out as an entity. I reify it. I hypostasize it if I'm in the natural attitude. But part of who I am and part of the psychophysical processes that explain my behavior are perceptual processes. And so there's a cluster of different perceptual processes. And those include visual, um, gustatory, olfactory, auditory, introspective uh, perceptual processes that go along with sensory processes. Um, another um, set of psychophysical clusters are my personality traits or dispositions, what we call some scars. Um, so, you know, there's whether I'm angry or patient, whether I'm a kind person or an unkind person, whether I'm a greedy person or a selfless person, all of these different psycho, these dispositions to behave in particular ways. Am I a sleepy person or an active person? Um, am I a good mathematician or a lousy mathematician? Am I a good musician or a lousy mathematician? These are all the some scars, another part of what it is to be me. And as you can see, there gets a very diverse cluster of different kinds of properties. 
And finally, there is the cluster of conscious properties of the things of which I'm aware, the things that show up for me in cognition. Um, and, you know, there's, again, lots of different cognitive processes. Um, but the, when we talk about the five sets of clusters, what we're talking about are this tremendously multidimensional um, character of what it is to be a living conscious organism. And you can't um, reduce me to any one of those or to any individual thing within those clusters. So one of the reasons that Buddhists talk so much about the psychophysical clusters is in order to displace the idea that there's a single thing, an Atman or a self or a core that constitutes who I am. Instead, there's just this very complicated, ongoing, multidimensional set of psychophysical processes. My question is, uh, do you see white contradictions or harmonious construction between uh, Navayana Buddhism and the deep philosophical and psychological thought that we have in classical Buddhism? Okay, let me see if, let me paraphrase it and you tell me if I've got it right. Um, do I think that Buddhism is sometimes committed to contradictions and that thinking in a way that tolerates contradictions is important to understanding Buddhism? Uh, yeah, you can paraphrase that in that way as well. But especially with respect to Navayana Buddhism and the current developments in India, uh, because uh, this is something which is uh, which we Indian Buddhists who practice as Mahayana constantly face, you know, the Navayana narrative. So, so what do you find? Like, you know, uh, like we should have these contradictions, or as what Navayana say, Navayana folks say that you know this is the most enhanced way of you know Buddhism. Yeah. Okay. So I think that tolerance of contradictions is really important. And I think that it's one of the ideas that Buddhist logicians brought to um, brought to world intellectual uh, history. So when we look back at early Buddhist logic, it's defined by the Chattuskoti, by um, partitioning logical space into four rather than into two, and understanding that sometimes it, you don't want to say that something is just true or just false, but maybe neither true nor false, or even both true and false. Now, that was an idea that was considered pretty radical in classical India, and eventually it faded out as um, Buddhism adopted a Nyaya logic, which was more bivalent and just gave us truth or falsity and threw out the both and the neither. But in 20th and 21st century, um, European logic, um, lo logics that tolerate contradictions have come back into center stage, so-called paraconsistent logics. And people who study um, the history of Buddhism say, wow, um, paraconsistent logic isn't the invention of 20th century logicians. It's the um, invention of second century Indian logicians, or actually maybe fifth century BCE logicians, because the Buddha uses the Chattuskoti. Um, and so this partitioning of logical space into four, and so the countenancing of contradictions in the discussion of reality, and especially Nagarjuna, who really articulates very deep paradoxes concerning emptiness, um, I think is really important. And it reminds us one more time of the danger of confusing reality as it appears to us with reality as it is. So like a lot of my work in logic, um, independently of my work in Buddhism, before I started working in Buddhism, was in paraconsistent logic. So maybe I was already primed um, for Buddhism. And when I talk to people who resist contradictions and think that to be coherent, you've got to be non-contradictory. I ask, which deity whispered into your ear and said, don't worry, the world is completely consistent? No deity ever whispered in, that into my ear. And, it may, and the idea that the world has to be consistent is simply the idea that some particular way of human reasoning has to be completely adequate to reality namely one that allows sentences to be true or false, but not both. Um, I think that it's to the credit of um, early Buddhist thinkers 
that they recognized that reality may go well beyond our human notions of cogency. And so an understanding of Buddhism that allows us to see when we need to think paraconsistently, that is beyond the consistent, is really important. Yeah, th thanks so much for the interview again. I really appreciate it. Um, I A few years ago, I remember talking to somebody and wanting to get a little more into, I was, I was profoundly impacted by Eastern philosophy in college, and it really changed my view, um, particularly Taoism for me, but Buddhism as well. And I remember one point asking, okay, who are who are contemporary Eastern philosophers? Like, if I want to read the the modern stuff, what what happens after some of these ancient text, texts and just interpretations of them? And I got two very different answers. One was, well, there just kind of isn't anything. Like, there's people that talk about it today, but there's nothing new. And the second one was, oh, there's lots of new stuff, but it's it's always commenting or iterating on how we understand the original and much later on in my career people inform no there's a lot of good contemporary uh philosophy going on in these fields so i'm curious um from the professor what what might be some contemporary uh buddhist philosophers that you like or recommend reading and sure. have you seen any differences or changes um that are kind of consistent or coherent over time Okay, so the first question is, who are the really cool contemporary Buddhist philosophers writing right now? Um, I think that, uh, of course, it depends which Buddhist school you're interested in. Um, a lot of the folks I read are Tibetan scholars. Um, so I think, for instance, if you start working on the stuff by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, he's a contemporary Buddhist scholar who's doing really cool stuff. Um, Matthew Ricard is also doing real cool, really cool stuff in the Tibetan tradition. Uh, Tupton Jimpa is. Um, uh, Sonam Takcha is. Those are all a bunch of Tibetans or Tibetan hangers-on who are doing that. Um, Tupton Chudran, she's an American nun who, who's writing really brilliant stuff in um, very much a, a, an authentically Buddhist vein. In Japan, um, Yasuo Deguchi is doing really cool stuff. Um, in um, China, in, in Taiwan, I, I think Ching Ken is writing brilliant stuff right now. Um, there's a whole lot of people in, over there in Taiwan right now. It's like an explosion, but Ching is one of my, one of my go-to guys for really cool stuff happening. Um, there's a whole lot of contemporary um, European and American um, Buddhists who are doing interesting work um, in the engaged Buddhist movement, for instance, Bernie Glassman, um, Sally King, Chris Queen, doing very cool work. Wow. Um, uh, Bill Waldron is is writing brilliant stuff on Yogacara. His new book on Yogacara is quite dazzling. Um, but I think, no, it's, it, you, if you just go to Wisdom Publications, um, to Shambhala Press, to Oxford University Press, um, Columbia University Press, uh, Dharma Press, uh, you'll find tons of contemporary work in Buddhist philosophy. Uh, Parallax Press as well. Um, Kaz Tanahashi's work on Dogen is really cool. Um, there's just so much. It's just it's a gigantic, a gigantic ongoing literature. So I would, I would just keep reading. Um, I forget what your second question was. Oh yeah, and thanks so much for those names. Um, I'm going to try and try and catch them all in the replay. Write them down. Um, do you notice? I know in in so, for example, like you mentioned, you start out in this kind oh, of Western... continuity and change, continuity and change. Yes, exactly. But like, uh, yeah. Central idea in Buddhism is the idea of impermanence, right? One of the central ideas in all of Buddhism from the very beginning. And what impermanence means is that all phenomena are constantly changing. But <clears throat> we also have dependent origination which means that the change is always conditioned by previous causes and conditions, contemporary causes and conditions. So the Buddhist tradition from the time of 
the historical Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, to the present has been constantly changing and has been constantly changing in a kind of coherent, systematic way in dialogue with other traditions and through internal dialogue among Buddhists. And that is no different in the 21st century than it was in the 5th century BCE. So yes, we're 2,600 years past the death of the historical Buddha. You expect a bunch of things to be different. But it's Buddhism, so you expect a bunch of things to be continuous. And that's exactly what you find. And anybody who says, this isn't authentically Buddhist, because look, this isn't what the Buddha was talking about. I just want to say, anything authentically Buddhist has to recognize impermanence. And that means it has to be a recognizable descendant, but um, it ought to be different. Otherwise, Buddhism would be stagnant. Nobody wants to simply read stuff that people believed 2,600 years ago. We want to see how that makes sense for us today. Thank you, Jay. I have a question in the chat room. It's from Wissom. He's from uh, Harvard. He's in uh, neurophysics. So this is, is just a statement he's making to defend himself, basically. He say, adding nursed, as in N-E-S-S, to conscious isn't about turning consciousness into a thing, but rather giving us a way to talk about state of being conscious, uh, nor does it come with metaphysical commitment. Yeah, I guess I disagree with, well, I agree with the first <laughs> and disagree with the second. Um, <laughs> yes, it's talking about a state of being conscious, but to think that there is something which is the state of being conscious is to hypostasize and to reify um, is to reify in exactly the same sense. So I don't think that, that that's any any different. I think we do end up with a metaphysical commitment. And I mean, the metaphysical commitment that there's something common to all states in which one thing is conscious of another. And that is, by definition, a metaphysical commitment. It might be a correct one or incorrect one. I personally believe it's incorrect. And the questioner might believe it's correct. But it's, that's what a metaphysical commitment looks like. Would you say then that you would differentiate some like between the state of being conscious and just being conscious? Uh, no, I, guess, I, I, I don't even know what that would mean. But what I want to say is there's no single thing which is the state of being conscious that is, con that is um, universal to or present in all situations in which one thing is conscious of something else. Um, that there's no reason to believe that every episode in which we say A is conscious of B is an episode that possesses a property that all of the others possess. So I mean, if you if they're invoking a state, meaning it's a persistent state, right? Something mm -hmm. that is static, ongoing, right. right? That do you think that this particular process or what I'm calling becoming more aware? Do you think that the sense because you see, usually there is the debate between the existence of consciousness, which let's say posited by Advaita or and non is is a more metaphysical debate, whereas this. Uh, aspiration of becoming more aware, becoming more conscious, uh, conscious is something that is common maybe to all tradition, but definitely to Vedanta, Buddhism, all these. Do you think that that is the more important part of it and the metaphysical debate is something that, for let's say a practitioner, that is something that is not as uh, important because um, because, you know, this idea of, let's say, call it nirvana or enlightenment or whatever is something where is obviously a, a, a space where you have sort of reached a certain psychological condition and only then would you be appreciate that. I hope my question is clear. I think it is. I, I would say that what's important to the practitioner is to stop getting involved in the, a metaphysical debate about the nature of something which is only a hypostatization. And the point of the, for the practitioner, at least in the Buddhist tradition, is to increase their own insight 
into the nature of the experiences they're having, into the um, process, into the cognitive processes that underlie those experiences, and into the phenomenology that structures their life, so as not to confuse that phenomenology with metaphysics. So it's one thing for me to become aware that I'm reifying my subjectivity or myself, that I'm reifying my experience, that I'm reifying an apple around me. Um, and another for me to say, gosh, well, what's the nature of the apple? Um, if the apple's already reified, then it doesn't, it doesn't have a nature. It's empty. So would you then say that, let us say there is a practitioner, uh, would you say that that even though they may come to some kind of a state of clarity, it is the description that they give of the philosophy or the metaphysics, etc., that may differ and that could be viewed as some kind of difference in articulation and maybe is, uh, is more secondary to what their actual, uh, you know, uh, becoming state of becoming conscious is. You know uh, what I'm saying? Like, no, I don't really. I um, what I don't. what I mean is that you know, like, uh, whereas a Vedanti might insist on the existence of consciousness, and a Buddhist might say that no, that is not really the the way of things. But in terms of uh, their appreciation of reality, they might both a yogi and a Buddhist uh, meditator might have both advanced along in their development psychological to a certain uh, similar point and it's just different these pers these are different perspectives of like you no, said no i don't no no things. i don't want to i don't want to fall into the trap of saying that people who disagree fundamentally really agree only are using different words that's kind of like the wonderful story of Bertrand Russell giving a lecture in New York and a woman comes up to him and afterwards and says, isn't it wonderful that I'm a Christian and you're an atheist, but we believe in the same God? Um, no, don't do that, because you're <laughs> trivializing deep philosophical differences when you do that. OK, thank you for this. It's been uh, really useful. I'm not a philosopher, uh, so the question I asked might be naive, but I keep hopping between Vedanta and Buddhism wondering about the differences and what's true. Um, my question is, what, what notices, what notices any experience? Um, another, if, if an experience is noticed, it's noticed by another experience. From the Buddhist perspective, from the Vedanta perspective, it's noticed by pure subjectivity. But Buddhists reject that in, term, in favor of one experience being directed on another. Thank you so much for sharing your insight today, Jay. It has been enlightening discussions, and I'm sure the audience will, will, will get on to it in a bit. Thank you, and I hope to see you again, maybe. Thanks, Thank you all for fabulous questions you, and contributions. I've loved we it. To come back again, Jay. We sincerely yeah, yeah, to come back again. We want more of your time and more of your inquiry with you. So. Okay. Thank Eventually, you. I will. Thank Take you. Bye-bye.